All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the weekly Living Earth Collaborative and Washington University EEPB seminar series. So today is our first April seminar, and for April, we're featuring the importance of using proper pronouns. And so I hope you enjoy the slideshows that the bio, uh, sorry, bio, the biology inclusion committee prepared for us that we played at the beginning of um, the streaming. And so before we get started, I have a little announcement to make for the LEC. So if you were here last year, you might remember that we had an environmental racism panel that the LEC held. And so the news is we are doing it again this year. And this year's focus is on how the history of land use shaped the development and biodiversity in the St. Louis region. And so the panel is going to happen Friday, next Friday at 2 p.m. And it will also be live streamed. So we'll be posting the information in the live chat. Um, so Matt, if you can help me post that link, that will be great. And uh, we will also, uh, the, the email advertisement for it from the LEC should also go out soon as well. So keep an eye out from that. And so this is an event that we held together with the CRE2. OK, so with that little announcement, now on to today's seminar. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, Michael Dawson. Michael got his bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Toledo and went on to complete his master's degree at the University of Missouri here at St. Louis. And so he was working on amphibian uh, kidget fungus during his uh, master's degree. And Michael started working at the St. Louis Zoo on the education department in 2002 as an animal artifacts curator and also a naturalist instructor and has since developed and managed several different citizen science projects and initiatives like the St. Louis Frog Watch or the Turtle Road Watch Program, which uh, I believe we'll hear a little bit about today. He is also an adjunct professor at the Webster University and teaches animal behaviors and citizen science there. And uh, Michael also likes to spend time with his family exploring the outdoors and in his spare time dabble in geology and botany. And so today I believe Michael will tell us about a relatively new program called the Spring Peeper Program on which he is uh, spearheading. And that focuses on monitoring and the conservation of spring peepers, chorus frogs and cricket frogs in the St. Louis region. And so I'm really excited to hear his talk. And so with that, take it away, Michael. And um, remember to put your comments and questions in the chat and we will relay them to Michael at the end of his talk. All right, so um, take it away, Michael. All righty, I'll jump right in. Just give me one second here. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so I am Mike Dawson. I'm going to be talking about the our Spring Creeper program, which is a newer program. It's a wild care program at the St. Louis Zoo. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening, at least what we're learning about uh, three of our smaller spring breeding frog species in our St. Louis metro area. Kind of give you a snapshot of what the project is, how we kind of came about the project, um, and then what we're finding right now. So what I wanted to start with, and, and typically when I do start a presentation, I like to start it with a little bit of noise. Um, so if you're listening out there, hopefully this won't be too loud. So just give you a fair warning. I'm gonna play a few frog calls here that are from the field that we've collected in the, the St. Louis region. So hopefully you're, you're hearing this call right now, and this is what you could be hearing around the St. Louis area, depending where you live. Um, and it depends what places you're looking for. However, this is something that you're unfortunately not going to hear in the St. Louis metro area, at least deep into the metro area. And I'm going to talk about what we're finding and why we're not hearing this possibly anymore. So if you're not familiar, you didn't grow up here, I didn't grow up in the St. Louis area. I'm, I'm from our Florida. Um, but what I've learned by living here about the last 20 years is uh, the watersheds of St. Louis are actually very fascinating history if you get a chance to read about all of them. Um, and so one of the things we're investigating too is in, in looking at the history of some of them is what's going on with the watersheds? Um, what happened to them in the past? And if you've lived here long enough, you might've heard of some of the issues with Coldwater Creek. Um, 
with radioactive material that's leaked from the atomic bomb uh, project. You might have heard about some of the different areas and rivers and creeks that starting with the, the building of St. Louis that eventually became sewers for the city. Um, and they've gone through a lot of changes and iterations over time. Some of them don't exist anymore. Um, if you know a little bit about Forest Park, you might have heard that they've originally boxed in the river that went through Forest Park and then eventually concreted and then eventually is now underground. Um, so a lot of our rivers and creeks, especially in this metro area, and even as urbanization has moved out um, away from the core of the downtown cities, um, has altered a lot of our different watersheds. So one of the things we're seeing now, um, I think, are the effects of some of these watersheds that have changed over time. I'm going to advance this here. Whoop. So one of the things that we're seeing here, oh, you just saw two pictures go by, hopefully really fast. Um, <clears throat> but you're seeing a lot of the channelization that's happened to some of our rivers here. Um, and these are pictures right now of River De Pere, and I'm not picking on any particular river system here. But one of the major changes, um, unfortunately, to some of these, and if you look at this particular picture that I have up, um, you're noticing that the sides are pretty steep now, and a lot of this is for control of flooding and things like that. But the vegetation is no longer where it used to be, and there's not woods on either side. There's not a riparian zone. Um, so it does not become inhabitable anymore for a lot of different species. Some are still here, and, and some are not. Um, and so when I moved to St. Louis and I started doing a lot of bio blitz activities and leading hurt groups and surveying some of our rivers and creeks and, and different places and going into Forest Park and seeing what was there frog wise. Um, well, I did start finding quite a few things. And one of the things I noticed at some of these different places um, that were interesting is that besides having areas that might have been concreted in or chain straightened or something like that, um, a lot of these areas were being used for fishing, and that I think might have a big effect on some of the animals I'm going to talk about. Um, but it, it did change some of our topography. So some of the urban city, uh, little city areas, a lot of the places that still have standing water, um, a lot of them have been converted in for fishing. Um, and sometimes even some of our newer subdivisions, some of the retention ponds have, have been turned into fishing areas. Um, and then the other issue you'll see is that a lot of the standing water areas that I'm looking for. And so a lot of the types of frogs and toads that I, I may be looking for, one ephemeral ponds. And so those are ponds that typically might dry out um, during the year, typically are fishless, um, but the, some of the places that are remaining and they're made for most part flood control um, end up with a lot of uh, excess of pesticides and herbicides and other man-made chemicals. Um, and if you look in some of these places, and I spend time in these places, my waders looking and trying to see what frog species are there. There's a lot of just physical trash in some of these places. And obviously this oil and runoff from the cars and what that is doing to some of our, our species in the water, I don't know yet. And that's something we, I'll talk about at the end that I am interested to see what, what is that doing. But when I started looking at the frogs and toads um, and, and, and looking around, there are a lot of frog and toad observations. And so I started looking at different places to find data sets and different uh, places that I could see what's going on. So I looked at community science data. I looked at a stream team data in different places. I looked at all the different data sets I could look at. And one of the things people kept telling me is that, well, we have lots of frogs and toads and there's all different types. And I kept being told that there's spring peepers and chorus frogs and forest park and different places. And when I was at those, I, I didn't see them. And so I started pulling up data sets and I looked and I thought, well, there are a lot of frogs and toads, but I wanted to look at individual species to see what's really there, because a lot of the data sets are being collected. Um, and I run a project and I'll talk about called Frog Watch, which is it trains individuals to go out and, and survey a site during the, the breeding season. And they hopefully monitor the phenology, the time on these frogs and toads. And they also look for the presence and absence of different species in our area. And they, they do have a lot of frogs and toads. But one of the things we noticed by looking at individual species is that we started to see that some of the species, particularly ones that fall into a particular group, um, and I'll talk about them, are these particular ones, and we're going to get into them a little bit deeper here, but the spring peeper, cricket frog, and chorus frog, um, these started to look a little spotty where you didn't see them um, inside that city. I had some observations that were reported, at least community science-based, that I wasn't quite sure if they were accurate, and I went to some of these places and I couldn't find it. But I kept hearing reports that they are in these areas or they were in these areas at some point. Um, so I started looking around for other data sets to, to see, you know, does the habitat even exist? Um, and one of the things that I came across, and I would recommend anybody else that's listening that is interested in, in looking at all kinds of terrestrial species, um, the USGS actually put out a gap analysis um, 
um, Species Act, and they have a lot of habitat prediction maps that are free access. You just have to cite their work, um, but they're, you can download all the data sets. And they're really interesting to, to look at. Um, they cover most of the major uh, vertebrate groups. Um, they have over 2,000 species um, that you're, you can look at um, and, and get an idea. And what these data sets typically are is they're based on typical range maps of, of known, uh, that are known for the species. But then they look at data cover. Um, they look at a lot of different parameters and they set up basically a prediction map of where these species may be based on some of the things that they would need to survive, whether or not, obviously for frogs and toads, is there a water source or is there land or terrestrial uh, forested areas nearby in a certain proximity? And so when they set all these parameters up by species, you start to get an idea um, of where they may be. Now, they're not always typically accurate, but the areas that don't show any color in them are indicating areas that may not be suitable. They may not have the um, what they would need to survive, depending on the species. So I, I built a map based on some of those data sets, and this is based on the three species that I was interested in. Um, and, and it looks at, you look at it and it looks cool. It's a pretty map, um, but it obviously is not as useful until you start to kind of zoom in. Um, and so this is uh, one of the ones I was looking at. So spring peeper, which is actually the name of our, our project. And the reason is it's a great charismatic species um, and it does belong to a, a, a Hylidae family. So the tree frog family. Um, but when you look at this particular map, you can easily see there's kind of a bald spot right in the middle um, where St. Louis is. And you can easily make out where Interstate kind of 270 is. And so it's predicting on these maps that they sh probably shouldn't be here based on land cover and water um, and other parameters. And, and so that also indicated, well, that's an interest. And I wish I had even found these, you know, a couple of years ago earlier um, before I even started out looking around, because it does give you a place even maybe where to even start looking. Um, and so I started looking at in these individual species. And if you zoom in, you, you do start to see little areas that they may be. And the farther you zoom in, the less accurate this is. Um, but there are things about this map that even, you know, it is accurate. accurate. And I'm going to talk about where I have found um, some of the species I'm looking for inside that 270 and easily where you find them on the outside. And I've been St. Louis 20 years. I know where to find them. If you drive out to outside of 270, you can easily find over 10 species, you know, uh, uh, of frogs and toads and not very hard, just going north of 270 and going east and west and south, you can find these species. But there is something, some kind of pattern or something going on inside that 270 sprawl. Um, and it does seem to slowly be continuing possibly past that 270 and, and certain areas. So I'm gonna show you one more. This is one that I, I thought would be pretty prevalent and, and common and some of the prediction maps based on some of their habitat features should be at least just on you know the, the surface looking at a, a, a map of, of different land uses should be, um, and I'll zoom in again, just so it makes it easier to see. Uh, we still have a lot of good creeks and stuff, especially as you go west of the downtown city area. Um, but what we're finding, and I'll go over some of them in more detail is we don't see them very often or even hear of them, um, these, these cricket frogs. Another neat pattern, um, if you go back out and, and talking to people, especially in the Midwest, or you start looking at some of these ranges, a lot of the species, for example, that we have here, um, and this is what makes the Spring Peeper Project a little different than a few of the other projects that are at the St. Louis Zoo, at least in the wild care, is that none of the species I'm looking at are endangered, um, and none of them are threatened. And, and as far as our state is going, they're doing well. But if you were to start going farther north and you go up towards Michigan, a lot of these species that range that far, some of them actually um, are not doing that great, at least as you go farther up, they do become threatened and endangered. Um, and so some of them on the northern end of the range, there is stuff happening at the broader level, um, but there may be also something happening at the core of a city level. Um, in Twin City and uh, Minnesota, they've also had reports of the same species um, slowly just kind of disappearing in the core of their city. So it may not just be something that's a St. Louis thing, it may be urban sprawl and the way that our city is designed as far as water quality and some other ones. And I'll talk about what I think might be going on with some of our species. Um, but it is, it is neat when you start looking at maps, it makes you start to think of, of what is going on and, and, and how can we either stop it. The one that I, I found fascinating, and I, I, I'm not quite sure if this map is accurate or is helpful. Um, we now have what uh, it's changed names in the last, I think, eight years. We used to, they used to call the, the uh, chorus frog that we have here, the Western chorus frog. Um, and due to some DNA work, we now are referring to it as the arboreal chorus frog. Um, and this is the map from arboreal chorus frog. Um, they don't typically show it here. Uh, it is definitely not in, in our city area. 
Um, but it, it is at past 270 uh, and Missouri Department of Conservation does show it in our state is pretty prevalent. Um, however, in the city, I, I can tell you it is not here. And you can kind of zoom in here. This map definitely shows it's it's not it's not inside 270 at all. And, and I have not have very few places I can find it. And even on the outside, in some places, it becomes a little spottier. So when we created this project, uh, we created it with the idea that one, we wanted to identify and protect the remaining populations of our spring peepers, um, the boreal chorus frog and the Blanchard's cricket frog, which is the, the species that we have here within that St. Louis metro area. Um, we, we may go on to expand this out bigger in the, in the Midwest, because when you look at some of the species I'm looking at, which do fall in that highlight day family, some of them are, are a little more specialized. The tree frogs, uh, which is the family they belong to, are doing fine. Um, but these frogs seem to be a little more sensitive to some of the changes that might be going on, and, and they do share something um, in common, which is these three frogs typically breed in those ephemeral fishless ponds, and that may be one of the reasons why we, we may not see them as often. Um, and the other one is to identify and study the urbanization causes for their decline in St. Louis metro area. And then the other two major initiatives for this project is to hopefully to increase the St. Louis urban amphibian diversity probably by establishing a viable and sustainable breeding population of these species that we, we listed and hopefully within that 270 beltway. Um, and then we, the biggest one right now that we're working on as well um, is, is to educate the public on the status of our local frog species, what's going on. And we do that through um, our educational arm, which is number one through our frog watch program at the zoo. Um, and so obviously our project is incorporated and we talk about it um, when we train some of our volunteers. And we have another project that we're also working on, which is through our iNaturalist platform. And if you're not familiar, it's pretty easy to find if you just type in iNaturalist. We have a project called Frog Call STL. And one of the things we're doing is using community science and crowdsourcing. Um, and I'll talk about how we're also surveying, but we do use some crowdsourcing um, to help us in areas we just don't get to and don't have time to, to collect audio recordings um, in some of the areas we're interested in. Now, right now, we're focusing mostly on our first initiative, which is to find out where some of these frogs are and to educate people. Um, we're hoping in the future we're going to get to uh, our number two and number three um, goals um, and hopefully get some of these guys possibly back into that metro area. So right now, at least last year, we started last year and into this year, um, we have been focusing on a traditional survey of the metro area looking for the presence and absence of those three frog species. And we're using a traditional a bioacoustic monitoring method where we actually have recording devices at very specific locations. Um, and we have some permanent monitoring sites that we're using where we are going to continually monitor um, these sites. And then we, we do move some around during our, our season, um, which gives us a pretty good idea of where we're not finding them and where we are finding these particular ones. Um, but we, I do have an assistant that does help me go out, and we go out in a couple of different ways. One, we obviously survey the site in person. Um, we do look for uh, larval species or tadpoles, wherever they are. We do look for adults, um, as well as using bioacoustic measures. And then, of course, we're using some crowd uh, crowdsourcing uh, projects to hopefully fill in some of those other areas. Now, with crowdsourcing, to hopefully increase our accuracy, um, we do only um, use the data from certified Frog Watch volunteer observations. Um, and as well as an um, iNaturalist allows you to do um, use research grade um, iNaturalist observations. And so we can go in our project and I can listen to all the recordings and I can download them, I can analyze them. Um, and we can, through the process of, of, of the research grade um, part of iNaturalist, um, if you get enough agreement on there, you can agree and typically bring up a, a observation to a usable um, observation. And so we typically, that's, that's where most of my data sets are coming from. And it gives me a pretty good idea of, of what's there and pretty testable, which is nice to have audio recordings to go back to. Now, what we have learned and what we decided, because the city, it doesn't seem like it is, but when you start surveying, it's, it's a big place. Um, inside that 270 belt. And, and with, we started with one person. I now have an assistant that's helping me that started last year. Um, but it, it takes a lot of time to go out and get these sites um, set up as well as just the behind the scenes of actually picking the sites that we might want to represent. And I'll show you why we uh, picked certain sites um, and what, we're, what criteria we're using. But a lot of it also comes down to getting permission to put recording devices in different places. Um, and so it does limit, you know, some of those places, which is why using iNaturalist and stuff that uh, um, 
having somebody record on their cell phone or something when they're at a place and they just happen to be calling um, gives us great data that I may not be able to get to. Um, but right, we uh, took the interstates, which I do think in some ways does confine some of our species. Obviously, some of them travel up and down um, our waterways, but a lot of those different waterways sometimes are almost corralled by some of these larger interstates. And so for surveying purposes, we did a couple things. One, we, we created some surveying zones, and so it was an easy way to lay it out for different years. Um, and what we did in 2021 is we surveyed, for the most part, if you want to look at this map, everything below um, 6440. And so it's a little easier inside that 270 belt. And it gave us an area of focus. Um, and so that's where we spent our time last year. This year, um, we are, we we're moving around. Um, and what we did is we put these recording devices and also into some different watersheds. And so we wanted to represent the different watersheds that make up um, these areas. And so we tried to get at least two or more, if, if possible. We also tried to establish the monitoring sites on the outside of 270 um, of areas we were pretty certain in, and we did indeed find this, all three species that we wanted um, as, as one, as a control group that one, when we go back and we start doing water testing, we know they're surviving there. We know they have good populations and it might give us a good comparison as far as habitat quality, because um, we may find some of those habitats still existing and we may be able to compare when we're looking at water quality and some other factors. And so we wanted to make sure, number one, that was one purpose. And the other one is that we know where there are really good breeding populations that maybe with green corridors and stuff, um, they might be able to hopefully travel. And so we wanted to identify some really good um, sites on the outside of 270. If you look up here, uh, we are we started out using what's uh, called audio moth. Um, they're pretty neat devices. They're pretty inexpensive, which is really good for the, the type of project, but the recordings are actually a lot better than I thought they would be for such a small device. These uh, devices do use, um, um, which is really similar to your mic on your telephone, but they pick up, I'm amazed, pretty far away. And the, the quality is, is, I don't think is that bad, um, but you can set them up on a, with a cord on your computer and you can set and put time on it when it's gonna turn on and off and stuff like that. Um, and so it's, it's pretty easy to put them out. They're very lightweight. The only thing that we had to do, and I'll show you in a minute, is we came up with a really easy system, um, which is hanging them from a bag. This year, we're also going to use a, a few different types of devices. We do have some bigger devices that on different properties that I think are a little safer for not worrying about theft or something like that. We're going to use some different ones for different purposes, but we are going to use a kind of a variety of, of recording devices um, to increase how many we can put out there. We started with 10 audio moths and over time, some of them um, for water damage or for other reasons over time, they may or may not work. And so we get smaller amounts. Um, so for, to, to survey, we had to be a little creative, but we still wanted to do a good job of making sure we're not missing some of these species. And so typically um, what we ended up doing um, is hanging something like this in a bag. It seems simple, almost too simple, but it works really well. Obviously, we, we try to put places that nobody's going to find them. Um, they are labeled as part of our project in a number. And I have had somebody actually call me um, who actually spends lots of time up and down the creeks and wanted to know what it was, which was great. It was great talking to somebody that lives in this area um, and let them know what we're doing for our project. Um, but for the most part, nobody sees these bags. Um, obviously, we got permission for all the places we've put them out. But what we've done is we're rotating these bags out on, on a, on, on a Pretty interesting schedule. So this year we've altered it a little bit. Um, they record the same amount of time, but this year we're trying from our sites to go for about a, a six days at a time um, at one site. Um, and we have several of those going at one time and then they're gonna move to several new sites and then they come back again. And so um, we're sampling in that method. And, and when they record, they turn on about nine o'clock at night um, and they'll record between nine and 12. And what they do is they record um, for five minutes long every 30 minutes. And it gives us a nice sampling up until midnight. And typically what happens with most frog species, some of them are gonna call past midnight, but most of them have all uh, at least um, started to call in between somewhere in between nine and midnight. So for sampling purposes, I think it works great, even rotating them around. I think if, since we're looking for the presence and absence um, and we're trying to see, obviously pick up quarter scene, we're, we're, we're gonna catch them if they, during that season. And we put them out starting, in March and go all the way. We try to get to February this year, we're a little later than getting them out in February, but we, we could, we try to in February and, and put them out from February, March, April, May, um, and sometimes up into June, just to make sure we haven't missed them. And the species we're looking for are typically spring breeders. And so once we reach that, past that point, we've, we've reached the time where they're done breeding. 
Now, for analysis, um, we started out actually manually just listening to them. Um, the first year we had over 120 hours of <laughs> recordings, and it's, it's a lot to sit there. I, I like frog calls, but I know my coworkers may not always enjoy because I don't always like headsets, so I like to just turn it on and listen. Um, but it does take time to go through all the different recordings. Um, one of the things we were, which is blessed, is we reached out and we applied and got a, a grant from Wildlife Acoustics, um, and we got a subscription to Kaleidoscope. Um, and one of the things about this software, which was nice, is you're able to take all the recordings um, and it, it actually analyzes them and it'll actually compare similar recordings to each other um, and do a cluster analysis. And so you, you can go through in little clusters and so you don't have to listen to all of them, but you get a good idea and you can classify each one. And what it'll do, for example, is if you just have, you know, a spring peeper calling, you'll have little groups of spring peeper, which is great. Um, if, if you have spring peeper and a chorus frog, that's different than just a spring peeper. And so you'll have that grouping. Um, and it takes a little bit and tweaking and stuff, and you can change a few of the parameters um, of, of the software itself, but you can kind of group them down and it's a lot quicker. And it basically pulls out all the things that does not have any recording. If it's just recording air, uh, it's not gonna do those. Um, and you can also classify when you're done. So once you've done recordings, you can make a classification and then run new recordings through that. And it's a little quicker. I mean, you can also go back and just to make sure they're accurate. Uh, but this has sped up a lot of our analysis um, as, as we can do this as it's coming in um, and see if we catch something. One of the problems with uh, using this approach uh, with a cluster analysis, if you were to have like a, a, a rare species um, or one that barely calls, you may miss it unless you individually went through and listened to all, you know, 120 hours. Um, but since we're looking for the presence and absence and we're looking for healthy populations calling, um, if it's one individual calling, I, I don't think it's gonna be a population that's gonna survive. Um, and we are trying to find where these, you know, the animals are still thriving inside that 270 belt. Um, but the other way we have found to use this is you can backlog or backload your data. And so when you run the data from the field, you can also put in recordings that you know have those species in them and they'll group them together and you can go through and, and make sure if something comes up, it's gonna group it with one that's in the field. So there are some nice techniques um, that you can use to make sure you don't miss. Um, you can also change some of the frequency settings um, so you can only um, group the things in certain frequencies. Um, now we do get a lot of interesting things in our recordings. Um, we had baseball games in the background. You can hear the bat smacking, people cheering, which is kind of neat groups of together. Um, dogs barking and all variety of things. I, I'm assuming a firework, that's what we'll say, it was not a gunshot, but um, you pick up all kinds of very interesting um, noises at some of these different places um, and when you go through and, and analyze them. So the group that we're looking at, and since I spent so much time talking a little bit about the way that our project came about, I wanted to spend a little time um, talking a little bit about the species we're looking for, because that's the most interesting part. Um, and so the group belongs to the tree frogs, um, and I usually consider their allies, but in our area, there's about seven different species in here, and I, I didn't list all of them down here, but the ones that in our area that are most common, of course, are great tree frog, the Cope's great tree frog, the spring peeper, um, our Bordeaux chorus frog and our Blanchard's cricket frog. And then most of these are the ones I'm looking for. In Illinois, there's a few other species that belong into this group. And it's something that our project may expand into. If you know anything about the Illinois chorus frog, which it is endangered species, and it's not that far from St. Louis. Um, some of these species are a little more, I think, specialized in their, um, some of their needs for their habitats, which is why some, some of them may, may disappear first or maybe more sensitive to a lot of our changes to the environment. But when you go into some of these different species, they're really neat. Um, so our spring peeper, if you've never heard of it, a lot of people have heard the name, but you may not know what you're hearing. Um, the frequency is pretty cool. It's between one, uh, 1.8 around there to 6.4 um, kilohertz. Um, it's typical about 0.5 seconds. And if you look down here on the graph, really easy when you see it. It's usually like a tweet, tweet, a little bird sound. I'm gonna go ahead and play one here. Um, but this is typically one calling. Um, and you'll hear this early in the season. Um, but pretty easy to identify. Um, you just have to get a little closer. Um, the, the sound doesn't always carry too far away. Um, and you do need to also think about the, there is a big difference between one or two calling and a chorus. And so I wanted to show you, some of them aren't, aren't as, as distinct, but the spring peeper, when you hear a chorus is deafening. This sounds nothing like an individual. That's about a couple hundred calls. 
Um, and we do get that uh, quite a bit on our recording. And, and obviously, if I was studying phonology, you can definitely look on the chart and when these guys go through and how many choruses. And, and this is typically when they may be laying mass eggs and, and fertilizing eggs. But it is is neat to hear that chorus. Very different than just one or two calling. But we have a nice variety from the recordings we've we've picked up on the, the different sites. Um, typically, these guys are small. Uh, most of the ones I'm talking about, um, all the three species, they're not very large. Um, they're about a quarter to an inch and a half um, in size, at least from, you know, about a vent to snout. Um, they're tiny. They do have a little X on their back as they become an adult, so it's a little easy once you, if you see one up close or see a picture. Um, the habitat, and this is from Unger Park, which is on the outside of 270, um, typically they're, they prefer sunny uh, ponds or shallow water, usually a lot of little growth around the outside is where, is where we find them here as well, but this is what a lot of the literature will point out. Um, sometimes you want to find them in, you know, streams and sunny banks, um, but typically for breeding purposes, they want that shallow uh, femoral type pond that doesn't have any fish and is just going to drain out at some point in the year. And in the wintertime, they're typically under the, the leaf litter. Um, when we're done with breeding, it believe it or not, it is hard to find some of these these particular species. They're good at hiding. The uh, chorus frog. Um, a lot of people might use this an acronym. You might sound like a comb or your finger of a comb or something like that. Um, but if you look at this one, it's and you follow the mouth. It, um, it makes a nice kind of a slow going up frequency. Um, but the typical length is about a second in noise. Some people like to use the word bri. Um, but I'll go ahead and play it. Um, it may not be as loud for you. And this one is hard sometimes to pick up. If I'm talking too loud and you're playing it, you're not going to even hear it. It, it depends on how you're hearing. Uh, if I gotten older, my hearing is not as good as it used to be. Um, but this sound can get easily covered up by other sounds out there, which is why graphing some of the calls, you can look at that frequency level and you can find them. Pretty unique call. These guys, I do think, may be a little more sensitive. Just these are one of the ones that are having a harder time even finding um, in different places. And so I'm not quite sure, but it is a little harder to find. It's something I can't wait to, as I dig in more into this project, to find out what's happening. We may find out this is the one that is might be disappearing even more than any other ones in the metro area. Um, size wise, oops, sorry about that. Um, size wise, they're uh, once again just like the uh, spring beaver, and they come out at the same time. So this, when you talk about breeding times, uh, all of these guys typically these two come out um, in February. So the spring beaver and the chorus frog are usually a, a end of the February time period, and they're going to call typically in through uh, um, April and finish up around May. Um, but these guys typically like a little more open um, area, a little less dense, um, and usually sometimes you find them in prairies and agricultural areas. But one of the things is you want low vegetation, and they are part of that tree frog family. Um, they do have toe pads, not developed like a tree frog. Um, they don't climb very well and don't go very high, so most of these guys stay on lower vegetation. The Blanchard's cricket frog, which is our third one that we're looking for, um, this one is very distinctive when you hear it calling. A lot of people love to hear the, like, the, the you can take two marbles hit together. It's actually very similar. And I've actually done that and had them call back to you, um, which is kind of fun. Um, but it, it's like a shrill clicking noise, um, and it's very distinctive. It, it looks like this, like staccato. We'll go ahead and play this. Very distinctive. Um, it's easy once you hear it. Um, but these guys don't typically come out until a little bit more into April. So right now is when you're going to start hearing them calling. And they're going to call through May. And sometimes I've heard them uh, even into June, depending on the, the year and season. Um, but very distinctive, a little bit bigger in size. Um, and, and they're hard to catch. The back legs are a little bit stronger, a little bit longer, um, and which is why they get the name cricket frog. They jump like a cricket when you get really close. Um, very unique. One of the neat things about this species that I find fascinating is they do have some different preferences. Um, so they are, like I said, a little bit bigger. Um, their habitat, typically, they do like, like the other species. Um, they might like a wooded area with a flooded pond or something for breeding. But you also find them quite a bit in a lot of the, the gravel bars and stuff. And if you look down those original prediction maps, that's one of the places it's showing them is a lot of times they'll breed in maybe pools on the bank not too far from the gravel bar, but uh, they don't doesn't take too long. Um, if there's slow water or something like that, they may breed um, around the gravel bars, um, just depending if the flow is strong, it's gonna be a little farther um, up in the banks. Um, but these guys are very, very neat, usually pretty plentiful and plentiful enough that these are actually listed as, as baits that you can fish with, um, which tells you in, in Missouri, 
typically were considered very common and probably were at one point. Um, but I've been the last 20 years looking for uh, different frog species, and I have not come across them inside that, that 270 belt. But now that I'm specifically looking for them, um, it, I'm hoping to find some of them. Um, now, one of the things that uh, I have come across in talking to people is a lot of the uh, misconception, I think, of what's going on is there's a misidentification a lot of times um, for those species. They, they've heard the term spring peeper. Um, we've heard things about peepers and the, the, the beginning of the spring. Um, and so a lot of times you hear different frogs calling and you get mistaken for something else. And the ones that I think are the most common um, are these two, which is the gray tree frog. Um, which comes out right now in April. So they're just starting to wake up. I've heard them around different places in the city. And the toad has actually come out about a week ago. They're pretty strong right now calling. Different sounds than those other ones I played, but it's good to hear them because they, they can't easily be mistaken. Most people have heard this noise before, the gray tree frog. Um, they like people um, as far as buildings. Um, and so they like to find areas where they'll echo their, their call. They come down from the trees and stuff like that. They might go in a fence post or something like that where their sound echoes. Um, they like to breed around people, pools and ponds and stuff like that. Or at least they, I would say they like, they can breed around people, pools and ponds. Um, but very unique sound, but it is not one of the ones I'm looking for. And they're doing fine. You can find these all over the city in the metro area. This is another one, the Eastern American toad, which if you listen, it has that nice high-pitched trill. And you can see how easily it might be misconfused with maybe the peeper or something like that, but it's a little bit different. It's a constant trill, um, but it is one of the ones when I do find people, you know, they say they hear them in Deer Creek Watershed or some other place and they can get me recording and send it to me. These are the, the two that I get sent the most and I think are the most mistaken for those other species. So what are we finding? Uh, well, this is exactly what we're finding. So as of last year, um, and even into this year, we are, of course, monitoring now some new sites up in here. These are the only sites um, that we monitored that had all three of these species. Um, so Unger down here, we had the spring peepers down here. Um, Edgar Queenie Park had, um, and I take that back, Unger Park, um, we've only picked up spring peeper down in this corner down here. Um, and then uh, Queenie Park, uh, which is one of our outside ones, we did find the spring peeper and chorus frog um, calling from that one. Um, but no uh, cricket frog, which is interesting. We didn't find any at, at that spike. Now I know going a little farther out, we can easily find them. Um, but what was interesting in our biggest find this year so far, which is really neat, is Jefferson Barracks um, was one that had all three of our species calling. Um, and I, I, I find it very fascinating. And one of the things I think that we're gonna start looking and seeing is that if you've been any time in, in down in uh, Jefferson Barracks and you go into some of the wooded areas, it's full of sinkholes. Um, and uh, sinkholes are actually wonderful habitats for frogs and toads. And I, I do find them, I, I did live in Florissant for a while and there's a lot of sinkholes up in North County. You do find a lot of these species up outside 270. Um, and I do think that these types of habitats, I hope we can find ways to protect them. Um, they do create those ephemeral ponds. You can't develop around a sinkhole. Um, they have water that sometimes is permanent, sometimes it drains out. So sometimes it's it's not there all the time, but it creates a great habitat for these species. And I do think that might be why. Um, we even have found, which is kind of cool, um, not looking for them, but we also came across uh, green tree frogs, um, several of them calling down there. And they may be an accidental introduction. They're outside of their breeding range. Typically they're farther down in the boot hill. There's a few other places, one or two in the Ozarks, but they're definitely not considered in our area. Um, but we do have recordings of them in Jefferson Barracks. So either, they were actually brought there in a truck or something like that. And we're not sure how they got there. And there wasn't that many calling, but we did pick them up in our recordings. Um, so that area right now is, is really neat. Um, so we are looking at some of the green quarters in that area um, to see if there's ways to get those species to go even farther up into the River to Pear areas, at least at some point. So what could be the cause? Um, I, I do think habitat alteration and destruction is probably the number one um, cause. Um, the lack of, of suitable breeding sites, uh, the lack of these fishless pond areas. A lot of these watersheds have great initiatives and they've been cleaning up like Deer Creek Watershed. And I think the River De Pere has a great uh, water uh, a coalition um, and they are cleaning up some of these areas and the water quality is getting better. Um, but I think what has happened is they, maybe they've lost um, some of these species in that process and there is no way to get back. Um, there's been a huge, I think, disruption in normal dispersion patterns. When you added in all the roads and some of the subdivisions and it is spread out, there isn't a great way for some of these species to move. 
Um, and these species do move um, quite a bit, but if it, there is no physical way for them to get there, unlike other species that can fly or something like that, they're not going to show up. Um, in my past, I did. I used to install water gardens in, in Toledo, Ohio. And then when I used to install water gardens, typically we're always like, yeah, three years after you put a pond in, you know, you, you may get some species show up. And I think that's true if you were farther out and you were in areas that had places closer with all these species. But I think in some of these areas, you're just not going to, there's no way for them to move, at least the way that we have green corridors set up now. They're not very frog friendly. Um, and that's something I'm interested in, in seeing what we can do about that. Now, there are some areas I'm interested in for future, and I'll talk about it, but there, it could be something where levels of different types of pollution, being salinity, one of them. Um, ice melt, um, when we do put out salts and stuff like that, there is a lot of literature and a lot of studies slowly going on about what the effects may be in some of our areas. And being that these guys breed in the spring, and a lot of them are these little pools of water near roads, it is possible that you can have a massive salinity spike, um, which also shoots up the pH. Um, in that case, there could be some developmental issues in eggs. I, and it's something we don't know for sure. It's something obviously we want to look into. I do know in some of the places and some of the data um, we're going to start looking into, uh, there is some precursor data that shows that every year there is a salinity spike. Um, and if you were to look into so like the confluence area, they can see that the salinity shoots up, especially after big storm. Um, and so there may be a correlation between some of, some of these changes and it's something that definitely look into. Um, there's always, there's a lot of literature about uh, changes in water quality, especially um, with peepers and things like that. There's some literature out there about preferred pH ranges um, for development of um, typically the eggs or at least the larvae inside the eggs. And so there may be something going on there or there may not. It's something that I think needs to be studied. Um, there may also be, you know, diseases could be a factor, although I, I think there the first one, which is the main one, which is habitat alteration is probably it. But these other areas, I think, could be a, a small contributor to some of these things. Um, and especially when you talk about pollution, there could be many other things. Um, a lot of those uh, subdivision areas and parking lots and stuff that have the retention ponds, they, they collect a massive amount of pollution in some of these places. And when frogs are breeding in them, they may not survive. And I have found other species in frogs and they seem to do fine. And so it may be it's the species is not the ones I'm looking at are those habitats they just can't survive in. Bullfrogs, um, some leopard frog species um, and green frogs seem to do OK, because I know because I've seen them and I've caught their tadpoles in water that when I look at water quality, it scares me. Um, I wouldn't want to be in that water quality, but they seem to be surviving. So our next step in the project, um, we're still not done this year. We are still in the middle of auditory uh, surveying some of the areas north of 6440. Um, and we're going to try to finish up this year. Um, and if not, we'll need to continue it next uh, into 2023. But we are interested in moving into looking at the sites we've surveyed now um, and actually start looking at some of the salinity and the pH and uh, some of the other water factors um, and then have some of the habitat factors. We're also interested in, in data mining in the future. Uh, some of our stream team data, we want to take that data set and with our own data set and create a bigger data set of what's happening. Most stream team data, of course, is, is stream team data, which means it's not connected to some of these other water sources. And so we like to put those data sets together to get a better idea. Um, and finally, we like to work on hopefully designing some type of like a habitat viability study and to identify, hopefully, maybe there is suitable habitat still remaining and it's just these species couldn't get back to it. Um, Ultimately, we'd love to find ways to get them there, whether it's through green corridors. Um, we haven't really investigated the idea of reintroduction of their, their, they are a native species, and that's something that would obviously take a lot of discussion and whether or not it's even a good idea. But we are interested in looking at least at those green corridors and seeing if there's things we could do um, to possibly get them into those places. Um, we do have some bigger project goals, obviously looking at the Midwest as a whole, but as far as the city, these are the directions we're, we're going hopefully to next year. And we're always looking for people, um, if there's an interested parties out there, that may already be working on something like this or interested in collaborating um, to, to test some of these things and look in some different factors to see if there is any correlation. Um, I am interested in also microplastics and what's happening if there's a big difference between the microplastics found inside some of these sites versus farther out, and which I would imagine there would be, but it would be neat to, to see the data itself. Um, ways you can get involved if you found this project of an interest at all, obviously you can reach out to me and I'm more than happy to talk to you more in depth about this project. Um, but if you just wanted to see if, you know, help at all, um, the easiest way is if you were to get involved 
quickest way is if you make an account at iNaturals or if you already have one, um, if you record any frog call, it automatically, unless you make it private, will show up um, if it's from this area in my frog call STL project. And it helps us put um, observations on a map and areas for us to take a look in that maybe we've missed and, and we didn't see them. But if you, all you typically need is a smartphone. And, and if you're at a park, um, it's an easy way to get involved. I have another side project that's not listed here, but if you take a photo um, and I can identify it from the photo on iNaturalist, it'll also go into another project that we can also use and, and we only use the research grade level. Um, if you want to also become a Frog Watch volunteer um, and monitor a particular site, we do have chapter sites. You can also monitor your own site if you have one that you're interested in. And that also gives us data, you know, in our, our area that we're interested in. Um, the last thing, if you can tell someone about our project, um, the more we get the word out about what's happening, we are in the beginning of this project. It's exciting to, to hopefully move it forward. Um, hopefully in a year from now, we'll know even more if there are still some pockets um, a little north of 6440. And so we'll, we'll know a little bit more on the north side as we go up. Um, if you're interested and in just, you know, learn a little more about frogs, learn your frog calls, um, check out our, our, our website. We have one called frogwatchstl.com. Um, it's pretty, pretty easy to find. Um, but on there, obviously, if you're a volunteer, there's some resources, but there's some great resources. If you click through, uh, if you, that you can listen to frog calls, you can get a better idea of all the frogs, not just the ones I talked about, but all the different frog species, which typically in that metro area, there's about 10 common ones. Um, there are some rare ones as, as Frog Watch goes, we're interested in, but um, you can learn about all those on here. It'll tell you different ways you can get involved. Um, so that's a great resource out there, at least if you just wanna read a little bit more. Um, if you wanna learn more about my project, it's also on this page. Um, you can learn more about it as well. So that's that's the end. Um, if if you have any questions, I am open now and we'll, we'll see what I can answer. All right, thank you, Michael, for that wonderful talk. It makes me want to go out and herp this weekend <laughs> to invite those frogs and yeah. And so we do have some questions rolling in. So our first question, uh, it's coming from Anna Wassel. And so the question is, you mentioned how an individual frog of a target species within city limits wouldn't be a stable population. How do those individuals end up there and do they disperse there naturally? And I'm going to tack on like kind of my uh, sure. uh, related questions of mine is that the, those populations you found in those different parts within the 270 belt, like do you know, do you have an idea of their connectivity? Like do individuals migrate to, sure. um, from each other and yeah. They, they it, within an area for, let's just take Jefferson Barracks, um, within all the sinkholes, they migrate back and forth. Um, within that Jefferson Barracks bubble, they they can go farther south um, and, and into the east. Um, but as you go kind of northwest, they run into barriers, and I don't believe they do migrate. There, there are too many barriers for them to move out of that area. So in many ways, when we do find these, you do have, if you want to think of it as, you know, island geography, um, these animals are cut off. Um, if you think about the frogs and toads, and there are a lot, just not the species I'm looking for, in Forest Park, they typically don't move out. Um, there may be a few neighborhoods, you know, where they can get to somebody's backyard pond, but for the most part, they're going to stay in those areas. Now, within Forest Park, um, they do move around quite a bit back and forth. Um, and how they get there, they may have always been there, and the populations are just uh, either getting smaller and smaller, um, or sometimes they they get dropped off there. Um, and I, a good example, I've been doing bio blitz activity since um, let's see, 2004 in Forest Park. Um, and since that time, um, there were no leopard frogs, at least we could never, we never saw one, never caught one, never heard one. And the last eight years, leopard frog, uh, southern leopard frogs showed up, mm -hmm. um, showed up in a pond and there was a small group and you're like, where would that come from? Did we miss it? For you know it, they're all over Forest Park. Huh. Um, and when you talk to people who work in Forest Park, they're like, yeah, we didn't really have any tree frogs. And then they showed up on the north side and now they're all over the place. Um, so sometimes it may be that they somebody physically drops them off, dumps them off, um, or for animals like a tree frog, might have come on somebody's truck or something like that. Um, but for a lot of places, it's going to be isolated and they may not be able to move outside. Um, now, some of them that we are finding on, right on the outside of 270, if you were to follow some of the creeks that go under the interstate, um, they do go back and forth. But for the most part, they're isolated in the, these little areas. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Really, really great talk. 
Our next question here is from John Birmingham Jr. First, he says, thank you, Michael, great talk. It made me a little wistful as I did frog watch for a couple of years, but my hearing wasn't up to the task. He goes on to ask, are you considering using eDNA to detect these species? Um, at this time, no, but that would be an even cooler way to see if they're there. Um, it's something I don't have experience in, but it, it's something that I have discussed a little bit. Um, but as far as the, to answer it, as of right now, I was not considering that, but that is an awesome way to go. Thank you. All right, our next question is from uh, Diana Van Zandt. Uh, and the, it's, it says, amazing talk. I grew up right by Deer Creek and I'm honestly amazed that any living thing can utilize that as a habitat. Do you have any insights on how to remedy habitat fragmentation? And that's a very, uh, that's a big question um, as far as uh, the politics uh, of the areas you might live in um, and the way that our city works. Um, obviously, we have green corridors going through those areas, um, or at least nearby, and there has to be a bigger movement to get a lot of different people to talk together, whether it's, um, I don't think it was MoDOT, but uh, talking about um, our sewer systems, talking, um, getting green corridor people talking, people who live in the, the area, um, to be able to create a, a bigger map of what a, a green corridor might look like for a frog. Um, a lot of these animals can travel up and down streams if it was, you know, a suitable habitat, but a lot of them are going to need, um, not just, for example, River de Pair is a good one. I've taken lots of pictures of it. Um, there's just not enough coverage on the outside, let alone water quality, but the, you need woods and kind of a riparian corridor um, along these for them to go during the, when they're done breeding and stuff like that, but they, they live under the leaf litter. Um, it would take a bigger conversation um, there is things you could do locally in a certain location with some of those areas, like in Deer Creek Watershed, um, but it is a, one, it would take a lot of talking with governmental groups um, that have control um, or at least uh, stakeholders that would be involved in, in some of those processes. And it's a long term, like a long game um, type of approach. And, and it's something I am interested in down the road to, to get involved in, but it is something that would take um, a lot of people getting together and working together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that having this spring peeper program is kind of like a first step toward that as well. Yes. Sort of like how you have the data there, know what's the problem, and then you go on to the next step. That is cool. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Our next question is actually a, a follow-up from Liana, who says, also, I have vivid memories of seeing tree frogs in the umbrellas outside the Galleria's Cheesecake Factory in Richmond Heights. <laughs> How often do you find frogs adapting to urban spaces like that? Um, some of the species do fine. Um, tree frogs are one that I think, I mean, I don't like to compare them to a raccoon or an opossum, but um, I do think they're, they've adapted very well. Um, to, to living around people. Um, I've had some breed in a pool that, you know, they have chlorine in it, but I don't know how they survive, but the, the eggs hatch and the tadpoles hatch and you get little froglets. Um, so I do think some species can do okay. Um, I have noticed that some of the bigger rana species, so that would be, um, actually, I'm sorry, they changed the name, lithobates species. Um, so like your, your bullfrog, your green frog, your, your leopard frog seem to do pretty good because they're pond um, type species um, and they do okay around people. Um, and there's some uh, exceptions in some air animals. Uh, for example, if you were to go out in Chesterfield, um, I think there's, some, I think I found some behind one of the, I think of the strip mall out there. And there's like a red robin. You can find uh, spadefoot toads that come out and breed. Um, and they're on the edge of the farm field out there. So you still find pockets, um, that areas that they find to survive. Um, but over time, I think with development and stuff and changes, some of them will be pushed out unless their populations can, you know, remain large enough, they will eventually disappear. Um, a good example are spadefoot toads. Um, and, and, and that's a, a one that used to find up and down the river corridor. So up and down the Mississippi, Merrimack and the sandy soils from it flooding over. Um, but development up and down those areas, I think over time that you're just not finding them where they used to be. There's, they still might be pockets, but they're not where they used to be. Great. Thank you. 
All right, our next question on, is coming from Michael Moore. Uh, did you notice any differences in the way the frogs were calling during the pandemic? I know there is evidence that urban birds were not calling as loudly during the shutdown. Um, from what I can tell, no. Uh, and that's a great question. Um, and, and obviously, you know, when you talk about animals calling, you think about noise and, and all noise pollution. Um, from what I have recorded, I, I, and I didn't see any difference in volume of sound or any difference um, about their calls. But it's, it's something that if I think could be studied to see if there is a difference. Um, and obviously, you know, females are selecting out uh, males based on those calls. Um, and obviously, there could be something going on evolutionary wise. But as far as the way that I was collecting data, I didn't notice anything. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Jonathan Lossos. He says, great talk, Mike. Sorry if I missed this, but how does the habitat prediction model work? Also, is it my imagination or were the toads late this year? Um, so first of all, it, I, I, the toads I, were a little later than they have been in the past, but not late. Like uh, if you go and looking back in time, they're right on time. Um, typically, um, the way the weather patterns go, sometimes push them back a week or something like that. And so I, I, my understanding and what I know about toads, they're they're not that late in the scheme of things. Uh, they just may be later than what we remember a year or two years ago. Um, so the way the habitat prediction models work, um, to my best un understanding, and it's nice because you can actually download and read through what parameters they used, um, but there's a series of parameters. So first they created maps um, based on, which is kind of neat, um, the range maps. And then within that, they looked at land stat data and they would look at and classify it, whether it's forested, swamp or wetland, and then the individual herpetologist would decide for species wise, um, for example, how much open water source I guess would be needed. And there's definitely some issues with some of those maps as far as obviously I'm finding them in places that, you know, they may not be predicted. Um, but what it is, then they'll look at how far away a water source is to, let's just say a wooded area, if that's a requirement, like a peeper might need leaf litter to be to, to overwinter in and stuff like that and how much space it might need on uh, near wetland areas. So based on those factors and you can go through and it looks like a grid chart of you know ones and twos, yes, there's no's. Um, they use that to make a prediction map based on land uh, data, of, I would say water and data availability and then range maps um, to create those things. And so uh, that's the, my best understanding, but each species you can actually go through and look at what categories and which ones they chose. All the categories are the same, but they'll go through and, and they, in essence, code them what they believe would work for what species. And that's, and so there is definitely some air. It's uh, as you go farther and farther, like zooming in, it becomes less accurate and less usable. Um, but on, on a certain uh, level, it gives you a pretty good idea of where you would find those species. Um, and so they're more accurate the farther out you zoom out, actually. So, yeah, and that's a great question. Um, and I'd love to sit down and, and tear them apart again. Um, and, and if anybody has ever done um, habitat protection maps, that's something I'm interested in, in making my own um, in, in using that as some backdrop to, as a starting point. So. Great. Well, they seem like a great resource. Yes, I, I think they are. So. All right, so we're nearing the on 5 p.m. time. I'm gonna ask this one last question. So we have uh, a question from uh, John Birmingham Jr. again. Is frog habitat considered in plans for the zoo's North County property? Um, as far as uh, one of the areas, that, um, the answer for the zoo, there are areas that are considered uh, habitat for frogs and toads, like a more a natural area of that area. Um, as far as the, the other use of the property, I can't answer those questions, um, how it's going to be developed. Um, but there are really good frog habitats there. There are sinkholes on this property, which I love sinkholes, um, that are great habitats for frogs and toads. And, and those are areas that, um, which are really unique, um, and it's areas that they will stay that way. So, Okay, cool. So and then if I could say real quick, um, I want to thank um, the LEC for allowing me to come out and share what we've learned so far. Um, this is a great opportunity. Thank you so much. And I want to thank the, the St. Louis Zoo and the, the Wild Care Institute for um, helping me establish and uh, supporting me in this particular project. And thank my assistant, um, Trincy uh, Beasley, who without her help, I would not have gotten this far. So thank you. And we uh, thank you as well. Like we, you gave a wonderful talk, and we had a lot of um, 
compliments coming from the chat, I'll send you a link later. And so thank you again for coming to the talk. And on, I hope that you enjoyed these our, these conversations that we kind of like moderated through. And on, of course, like everyone, if you're interested in being involved in Frog Watch or the PIPA program, please contact Michael. And yeah. And so thank you. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.